Well, Donald Trump finds himself tonight in agreement with William Shakespeare. Donald Trump doesn't know that, of course, because Donald Trump is the most ignorant, least educated man in the history of the American presidency, including all of those presidents who didn't go to college and were self-educated. Every American president except Donald Trump knew or knows the famous Shakespeare line from Henry VI, the first, thing, the first thing we do, let's kill all the lawyers. In that play, Shakespeare was actually making the point that a cruel ruler cannot afford to have lawyers getting in his way. Shakespeare very much wanted his audience on the side of the lawyers. Tonight, Donald Trump is on the side of Dick the Butcher, the character in Henry VI who says, let's kill all the lawyers. Donald Trump is giving up on the lawyers who helped him get hit with an $83.3 million verdict in the E. Jean Carroll case last week. He announced on his social media today, I am in the process, along with my team, of interviewing various law firms to represent me in an appeal. Guess who is not interviewing various law firms for the appeal of the E. Jean Carroll case? E. Jean Carroll. E. Jean Carroll has the best lawyers Donald Trump has ever seen in a courtroom, Roberta Kaplan and Sean Crowley. Donald Trump finished his social media advertisement for lawyers today with a last line calling the lawyer he hasn't even hired yet. Crazy. He said, any lawyer who takes a Trump case is either crazy or a true American patriot. Respectable law firms who care about their reputations have been turning down Donald Trump as a client for many years, long before he was a politician. That's why Donald Trump has the most incompetent and unprofessional lawyers who have ever represented a president of the United States. Donald Trump could have made that last line of his social media post a bit more accurate by saying any lawyer who takes a Trump case is either crazy or needs the money or both. Donald Trump has spent more money on lawyers than any politician in history. None of that money is Donald Trump's money. The New York Times is reporting that Donald Trump has spent $50 million on lawyers just in the year 2023 with all of that money coming from the poor people who answer Donald Trump's electronic solicitations for money. These are the same people who Donald Trump told when he first became a presidential candidate he would never ask for money because he is so rich. I don't need anybody's money. It's nice. I don't need anybody's money. Yeah. I'm using my own money. I'm not using the lobbyists. I'm not using donors. I don't care. I'm really rich. Not rich enough. People who believed Donald Trump when he said that quickly became contributors as soon as he started asking for money weeks after that. $50 million is just for lawyers for the year 2023. Donald Trump had massive legal expenses in 2022 and in 2021. And those legal expenses are only going to get bigger in 2024 now that his teams of lawyers are in preparation to defend criminal defendant Donald Trump in four separate trials in New York, Washington, D.C., Atlanta, and Southern Florida. There was a top secret hearing in the Florida case today to consider how to use classified information in that trial about Donald Trump's criminal possession of classified documents and violations of the Espionage Act after he left the White House. Donald Trump's lawyers were not allowed into this hearing. The hearing took place not in a courtroom, but in a skiff, a secure location for examining and discussing classified documents. Donald Trump's favorite judge, who he appointed to the federal court, Aileen Mercedes Cannon, presided in, in the hearing with only the Justice Department lawyers for the prosecution allowed in that skiff today for today's hearing. After the hearing, Judge Cannon filed a short note in the case file about the hearing saying, total time in court, three hours, attorney appearances, Jay Bratt, David Harbach, 
Julie Edelstein, J.P. Cooney. The best thing that ever happened to the National Football League is Taylor Swift. That makes Travis Kelsey the NFL's most valuable player by far because he brought Taylor Swift into the NFL. Trump supporters want you to hate Taylor Swift because she endorsed Joe Biden for president four years ago, and they desperately fear she will do it again. On Sunday, while Taylor Swift's boyfriend's team was on its way to a win, Trump media figure figure and lunatic Mike Crispy tweeted, the NFL is totally rigged for the Kansas City Chiefs. Taylor Swift, Mr. Pfizer, Travis Kelsey, all to spread Democrat propaganda, calling it now, Kansas City wins, goes to Super Bowl, Swift comes out at the halftime show and endorses Joe Biden with Kelsey at midfield. It's all been an op since day one. That means Baltimore's brilliant quarterback, Lamar Jackson, threw the game so that Kansas City could win because the NFL is rigged. And Lamar Jackson is part of that conspiracy, as is everyone else on his team. And now the Super Bowl is rigged. And Travis Kelsey is a bad person because he not only got the Pfizer COVID vaccine, He prominently appears in an advertisement urging others to get the life-saving COVID vaccine. Losing presidential candidate and Trump endorser Vivek Ramaswamy said after the game, I wonder who's going to win the Super Bowl next month. I wonder if there's a major presidential endorsement coming from an artificially culturally propped up couple this fall. Just some wild speculation over here. Let's see how it ages over the next eight months. So that clown also thinks the Super Bowl is rigged. It is fixed. No one, no one has ever said the Super Bowl is fixed before the madness of Trumpism seized the minds of so many people. For too many people, being a Republican now and a Trump supporter requires them to lose their minds. I believe that God is using him this day for a purpose and a reason. And, you know, God picks unusual people to do great works. And I think he's picking Trump for a great work in our day. There's no arguing with that. If someone believes God has picked Trump to be president, then they can obviously believe anything. And on June 14th, 1946, God looked down on his planned paradise and said, I need a caretaker. So God gave us Trump. Weeks before Donald Trump was born, school children were taught this song. He is the noblest being in the whole wide world. For Hitler we live, for Hitler we die. Our Hitler is our Lord. The people who forced the children to learn that song were crazed. The people who put out videos claiming God created Donald Trump so that he could impose tariffs, are crazed. That's actually one of the many insane lines in that video that we just showed you about God making Donald Trump our caretaker. This is now the first presidential campaign season in history with a beheading in America. That is not a common American way of death. A 33-year-old Pennsylvania man was arrested last night after allegedly posting a YouTube video in which he held up the severed head of his father, who he identified as, quote, a federal employee of over 20 years and my father. He is now in hell for an eternity as a traitor to this country. The now accused murderer went on to rant against federal officials and the Biden administration, the, quote, far left woke mobs, and, not surprisingly, immigrants. Madness knows no bounds. Someone tonight in America might be beginning what will become their descent into QAnon madness by believing the Trump supporter madness 
that the NFL is rigged, that the Super Bowl is rigged. Once you can believe one utterly insane thing, the door to your brain that was closed to insanity is wide open. And if you're Timothy McVeigh, you're going to end up blowing up a federal building, kill 168 people, including 19 babies. And if you're that guy in Pennsylvania, you're going to cut your father's head off with a machete, and your mother is going to come home and find his headless body in a pool of blood. Or maybe you'll just get rich being a Fox host. He can't name a Taylor Swift song. Taylor Swift can't name a Biden policy. This relationship was engineered in a lab. And Taylor's boyfriend, sponsored by Pfizer, it is a match made in corporate heaven. Could you imagine if the Chiefs win the Super Bowl? There is madness loose in the land. And no one fuels that madness more than Donald Trump. Today, the Biden-Harris campaign released a new ad all about Donald Trump's confusion. Donald Trump is truly confused. Nikki Haley is in charge of security. We offered her 10,000 people. They don't want to talk about that. He didn't just get me confused. He mentioned it over and over and over again. Yeah. He's not what he was in 2016. He has declined. That's a fact. I mean, we won last time. We won 50 states, right? This is not Donald Trump of 2016, guys. What? <laughs> what is... If he is off the teleprompter, he can barely keep a, co a cogent thought. I mean, that's just fact. We are an institute in a powerful death penalty. We will put this on. I think he's declining. I stumbled and mumbled purposely. I do speak in long, complex sentences, and I have a lot of material in each sentence. You have voter ID to buy a loaf of bread. You have, you have ID to buy a loaf of bread. Have you noticed? He's a little confused these days. A person close to Trump actually says that he's rattled by Biden's efforts to get under his skin. While Donald Trump is busy raising money to pay his lawyers, the New York Times reports the main Democratic super PAC supporting President Biden's reelection bid, Future Forward, is beginning this week to reserve $250 million in advertising across the most important battleground states, a blitz that it says is the largest single purchase of political advertising by a super PAC in the nation's history. Joining our discussion now is Simon Rosenberg, Democratic strategist and author of Hopium Chronicles on Substack. Simon, you're backed by popular demand. It's not just me. It's the audience. Everybody, that they desperately need to hear from you. Uh, there is the presidential campaign going on, and we're relying on you uh, to, to cover yep. it for us. Uh, the, we, I just want to play what the, what the Fed chair has said. And he's telling a truth that does not seem to have penetrated uh, the, the American consciousness widely enough. Let's listen to this. Yeah. This is a good situation. Let's be honest. This is a, this is a good economy. So uh, that's a Republican, and he was a, made the Fed chair by Republicans. President Biden kept yeah. him there. Uh, and he went on and on about, you know, it's the first time in 50 years that we've had unemployment under uh, 4% for two years in a row. Uh, he just went on and on about how strong this economy is. Uh, but it doesn't seem to be the perception out there among the voters who Joe Biden's going to need. Well, I think uh, voters on our side understand this. I mean, that if you break apart the, the understanding of the economy into the two parties, you know, Biden gets pretty good ratings from Democrats uh, on the economy. He gets, you know, zero from MAGA, right? And so it brings the whole n number down. But look, we, we have a—Joe Biden is a good president. We have a strong case to make for re-election. The country is far better off. I think he's met the fundamental promise that he made to all of us in 2020, which is he'd get us to the other side of COVID successfully. I think we're there. I mean, part of what— Chairman Powell was saying is that, you know, it's remarkable where we are right now uh, compared to where we were just a few years ago. I mean, just go through the list, Lawrence. I'll do it really quick, right? I mean, strongest recovery in the G7, best job market since the 1960s, lowest uninsured rate in American history, you know, the stock market setting records every day, real wages galloping and strong, the deficit trillions of dollars less than it was. I mean, remarkable performance, no matter how you look at it. And we should be really proud of that as a country and 
as Democrats, proud of our president for having met his fundamental promise to us that he was going to get us to the other side of COVID successfully. I think we're there now. A uh, couple of questions. Uh, well, let me start with polls. Is it time <laughs> to start looking at polls, something I really haven't been doing? Well, I mean, it's part of the discourse, right? You know, you can't put your head in the sand on this stuff, and you've got to try to make sense of it the best you can. I mean, last time I was on, you had an important obs observation, which is that the polling and the results that we're seeing in actual voting in states that have ads, like in Iowa and New Hampshire, tell us a little bit more about the election than these sort of broad general polls. And those polls and the results of those Iowa New Hampshire primaries were not good for the Republicans, right? Low turnout in Iowa, lots of concerns about the Trump presidency among large chunks of Republicans. You had Trump, as you pointed out in the show last time, coming down 10 to 15 points below his, um, you know, below public polling that day. I think there's a lot of evidence so far. The most important data that we have is that Republicans stru are struggling, as they did in 2022, as they did in 2023. And even today, right, I mean, I, there was one bad poll for Biden today, but let's go through what we learned today in the data, right? Just today, we had Quinnipiac poll that had Biden up six points, 50-44, gaining five points since the last poll. The morning console poll had Biden gaining three points. We had the... Um, I'm at my notes here, the Economist YouGov poll, Biden gained two points. So in three polls today, we saw a two-point gain, three-point gain, five-point gain for Biden. And we've also seen just in the last few weeks polling that has Biden ahead of his 2020 results in New Hampshire, Pennsylvania, and Michigan. So the polling, if you want to paint a positive picture for Joe Biden, the data is there. There's also data showing that things are not so good, right? And that's because it's still really early. People are not engaged. Polling's all over the place. It's not all pointing in the same direction. And we have to be careful not to get blown around by the noise in the machine every day. And I think it's why your point last week was so important. Let's focus on the stuff that happened in Iowa, New Hampshire. And that is not good news for the Republicans. Uh, as we go forward, uh, the, I'm looking at the, the fundamental proposition of how does Donald Trump, what is he doing? What is Donald Trump doing? <laughs> to try to convince voters to come to him who haven't come to him before. He's going to have to get voters who never voted for him before. Since he yeah. came in millions of votes behind Hillary Clinton, uh, 7 million votes behind Joe Biden, yeah. he's going to have to get some people to vote for him who haven't voted for him before. And I've never heard him speak to those people. Joe Biden does try to speak to people who haven't vote, voted thing. for him before. Yeah, I mean, look, the fundamental dynamic of this election is that Joe Biden's a good president, is going to have a strong case for re-election. The country's better off. And they're running the most unfit guy to run for president in all of our history, who's a far weaker candidate than he was in 2020. I mean, he's campaigning from the courthouse and not from the White House. He's more degraded, more extreme, more dangerous. His performance on the stump, as you pointed out, is wild and erratic and, frankly, disturbing, right, if you really listen to him. And he's also making kind of classic political mistakes, the kind of mistakes that candidates who lose elections make, like coming out against the ACA at the same time we're having record signups of this program and also, you know, taking credit for ending Roe. I mean, those are traditional political mistakes that can cause candidates to lose elections. I just think when you add all this up, right, the fact that we, the information that we have today that we didn't have about him before, right, that he's a rapist and that he stole America's secrets and he led an insurrection and he ended Roe, when you put all this together, it just gets very hard to see how this guy can win this election in 2024. And it's why I'm so fundamentally optimistic about where we are right now. Simon Rosenberg, thank you very much for joining us again. Thanks, Lauren.